Welcome to the University of New South Wales, Canberra, Australian Naval History podcast series, produced in partnership with the Naval Institute, the Naval Historical Society, Navy's Sea Power Centre, and the Submarine Institute. Thanks for joining us. We hope you enjoy this podcast and return for others in the series. I'm Professor Tom Frame, a former Naval officer and now Director of the Australian Centre for the Study of Armed Conflict and Society at the Defence Force Academy. The centre hosts the very active Naval Studies Group, so please visit our website. To find us, simply Google Naval Studies Group and UNSW Canberra. Ours will be the first website in the search results. This podcast is part of a series focusing on the Great War of 1914-18. Most students of Australia's military history know that the Gallipoli campaign spawned the Anzac legend, a powerful concept in both Australian culture as well as a constant theme in wartime history. On the 75th anniversary of the landings on Gallipoli, Greg Swindon co-authored First In, Last Out, The Navy at Gallipoli, which told the little known story of the submarine AE2, which was the first Australian unit to enter the Dardanelles campaign. And he also wrote about the RAN bridging train, which was the last Australian unit to leave the peninsula. In this podcast, we will examine the Royal Australian Navy bridging train, its formation, its men, and their remarkable contribution to this much studied but ill-fated campaign. To tell us about the bridging train, I have joining me in the studio, Commander Greg Swindon, as I've said, co-author of First In, Last Out, and several other important articles on naval forces at Gallipoli. We also have John Perryman, a former RAN signalman and now the Navy's historian at the Sea Power Centre. And we also have Martin Smee, who joins us via the telephone from his home at Port Elliot in South Australia. His grandfather, Laurie Smee, was a member of the bridging train. Gentlemen, thanks for making the time to be with us today and to have this, what I think is going to be a great conversation about the bridging train, little known, but I hope much more studied in the future. Greg, can I begin with you? What is a naval bridging train? I'm sure most people have no idea what that is. What is a bridging train? Well, the naval bridging train was the first and probably the only one that ever existed. Bridging trains were fairly common in the British Army uh, with the Royal Engineers operating those, mainly because when the British Army was going overseas, they were often uh, operating in underdeveloped uh, areas, particularly in South Africa, China, uh, etc., where they would come to a river and they needed to cross it. There was no form of crossing, so a bridge would need to be built. Uh, so the British Army, in order to manoeuvre its way uh, through the world, would often take a bridging train with them in order to basically cross uh, rivers and, and the like. So are they a kind of cross between engineers and marines, or is that overstating it? Well, in the British Army, they were engineers. In, in uh, the, the naval bridging train, they were very much marines in some respect. They were naval reservists who were banded together at the beginning of the war. Uh, in order to create a bridging train to operate with the Royal Naval Division, uh, which was a number of uh, British uh, sailors and marines who couldn't be employed at sea at the time. And John Perryman, where had the British used these bridging trains either earlier in the Great War or in previous campaigns? Well, in previous campaigns, the, the Royal Navy had a, a long tradition of overcoming obstacles ashore. Uh, and we see this uh, until recent times enacted with the, the famous Royal Navy's gun runs where they've you know, carried field artillery over really difficult terrain and, and when they had to get that firepower to the front. And that extended on to engineering as well. So at the time that the Royal Australian Navy's bridging train was raised in February 1915, the, the Western Front had opened up, they were starting to encounter some of these obstacles um, and there was a need for extra capability in that area. And that uh, the request went out, Australia had reservists there, many of whom seemed to have developed a bit of a penchant for this sort of terrestrial warfare, having been involved in uh, the, the uh, Boxer Rebellion. Uh, some of them had seen service in South Africa as well. So those men were ready volunteers for this and uh, when the unit was raised, uh, 
they put their hand up and, uh, and that's what we're here to discuss today. So Greg, where did these men come from? So were they just reservists who were unemployed? Were they people that might have gone to see if there were more ships or a greater need? Uh, where did they come from and why did they put their hand up to do this work? Well, when the Bridge of Train was formed, uh, its commanding officer, Lieutenant Commander Bracegirdle, uh, he'd served in the Boxer Rebellion. He'd served... Which in, was in China in, in China, 1900. 1900 yep. Yep. Uh, as part of the New South Wales Naval Brigade. He'd served in South Africa and he'd recently returned to Australia after the capture of German New Guinea, where many of the naval reservists were used as basically naval infantry. When the word came through that the, the RAN was to form a naval bridging train, the Navy very quickly and confidently selected Brace Girdle to be the commanding officer. He then went uh, throughout Australia, with the exception of Western Australia, because the, the rail link hadn't been created then, but went throughout Australia to the Naval Reserve depots and recruited men from the Naval Reserve. He knew them, he knew he could trust them, he knew that they'd been trained in, uh, in land warfare. Many of them had just recently returned from German New Guinea as well. Uh, so he went to uh, all of the states, as I said, without uh, Western Australia to do recruiting. And the first man he recruited was from his old Naval Reserve Depot in Newcastle, Abel Seaman Burgess, who had served with Brace Girdle in China. So these men, though, in their civilian occupations, were they engineers, were they boilermakers, were they tradesmen of some kind? So were they bringing skills from civilian life into the Navy, or did they basically acquire the skills once they were in? They were a bit of a mixed bag. Uh, Brace Girdle tried to uh, recruit as many tradesmen as possible, as you say, boilermakers, coppersmiths, uh, bridge builders, carpenters uh, and the like. Many of them were seamen and he was more than happy to take seamen who were ba uh, basically capable of turning their hand to any job and, and getting a, a reasonable job done. But some of them were you know, tram drivers or book binders. He even recruited some pearl divers from Western Australia. So they were really quite a mixed bag. Some had seen service in Germany, New Guinea, some had been in the Royal Navy, some had been in South Africa. Others were 18 year old students just finishing school. And uh, of those others, Martin Smee, your grandfather Laurie was part of the bridging train. Why did he enlist? What do you think drew him to this particular unit and this particular service? Um, at the time, Laurie was living down here at Victor Harbour. He was probably working as a farmhand. We don't have much information on what he was doing in the immediate time there. We think that he possibly went to New Guinea with Bracegirt, although that can't be confirmed as yet, which probably explains why he joined up with that particular group. Um, he was uh, he had a, a strange early life because he ran away to sea about the age of 12 on a, a Norwegian clipper that went over to England. He then sort of joined up with the Royal Navy and served on seven different ships until 1913, and then he joined the Royal Australian Navy. So um, as to what his other skills were, I suppose on all those ships, and he, he learnt quite a, a number of skills that would help him for that. And uh, he signed on to the bridge train from March 27th up at uh, Taparu. But as to what he was doing down here at Victor Harbour, we have really no idea. And so in the family, is he something of a legendary figure, a mysterious figure, or are there kind of skeletons maybe? Was he running away from things? Uh, is, it, is, is it possible to know? Um, well, he had a, uh, an early childhood. He was raised by his, his aunt. Uh, he has no birth certificate. When he was born, his twin sister died and his father never got around to registering as being born. And he was given to his aunt to look after. And her husband was a, a banker, so they, a uh, country banker, so they moved all over South Australia and Victoria. And uh, when they moved back to Semaphore, he didn't really like school a great deal, evidently. So, he decided about the age of 11 or 12 that he'd go off to sea. Everyone is what you did in those days. Well, plainly, and he joined the bridging train. He came under the command of Leighton Seymour Bracegirdle. John Perriman, what do we know about Bracegirdle that particularly fitted him for this command? Well, as Greg touched on earlier, Bracegirdle um, had a, a really interesting early connection with serving ashore. He'd gone up to the uh, China Wars in 1900 as a midshipman. Uh, he'd taken part in that. When he came back, he then transferred and briefly served in South Africa, in the South African Irregular Horse. Um, and then the Australian Naval and Military and Expeditionary Force in New Guinea. So he, he had that experience in working with the Army. And if the bridging train was going to be successful, 
remembering it's a naval unit, it's got that utility, um, that having, having that understanding of that, uh, what today we would call joint service, uh, he was the person to do that. Um, he demonstrated that he was a well-liked officer. Um, he was very, very, um, he set the high bar for his, for his officers, but he had a more visceral connection with his men. And uh, the research that we've conducted indicates that, uh, you know, they, they held him in very, very high regard. So he certainly had the ability to raise, and, raise train and sustain this group down in the domain in Melbourne, and, and they did that. Um, as Greg touched on earlier, a bridging train, um, it was supposed to operate in train, as in wagon train, uh, to and from the Western Front, uh, carrying pontoons on wagons. Most of the ratings in the bridging train were, were, were rated as able seamen drivers, as in wagon drivers, as opposed to internal combustion drivers, which came somewhat later. Mm. And, and the whole idea was this it would be the mobility of this that could get them where they needed to be. Um, their destination, of course, was the Western Front. Um, as you'll hear, uh, that didn't quite happen, mm. and they ended up at Gallipoli. But uh, we'd understand that uh, Bracegirdle, he's not a soldier of fortune, he's not a mercenary, is he? he he's not just a, a person for hire, yet he goes to China, he goes to South Africa, yeah. he serves here, he serves there. Did he actually have a profession besides being in uh, these irregular forces? Well, look, I mean, I think uh, as far as a profession's concerned, I mean, he was, in the, he was in the Navy, enlisted back in the Navy after he came back from South Africa. So I think that that's where his heart lay. Prior to that, he'd been in the militia, um, in the cadet scheme uh, before Federation, so he'd had this connection with the Navy. Um, as far as um, service is concerned, he, he, he grew into the role, I think, and he grew into it very, very well. And I think that when you look at more broadly the Dardanelles campaign and what was taking place over there at the time that the bridging train was being raised in Melbourne, and specifically now I'm talking about the Admiral in charge, Wester Weems, who arrives at uh, Mudros to find that there is absolutely no infrastructure whatsoever. Uh, there was nothing that he could find on that island which would be useful to him. And his greatest concern was uh, the lack of water that they would need for any assault on Gallipoli, where they were going to get that, and the fact that everything conveyed to and from Gallipoli would have to be done by sea. So we, we haven't got to the campaign, but we can already see that initiative is needed and Bracegirdle had plenty of it. Yep. He was enterprising, he could kind of make do, work around. He was that kind of a person. Was there perhaps anyone more experienced than him in this kind of work at that time? In other words, was he the perfect man for the job? I think it was very much a case of cometh the moment, cometh the man. And I think that the, the Naval Board picked the right man on this occasion. He, he saw the value of, of the Navy supporting operations ashore. He could understand the utility that the Navy could bring to sustain what we today we would call amphibious operations. Uh, if you cut that line of communication, you have a beleaguered army, and he understood that. Uh, and it wasn't just about supplying the army. It was about taking off the sick, taking off the wounded, and bringing in reinforcements as well. So it's not just about the logistics side of this, it's about maintaining that, um, that most important human element ashore as well. And Greg Swindon, we know the commanding officer's well trained and well experienced. How did he impart some or all of that to his men? So where did they train and what did they do? When the unit was formed, they uh, started their camp down in the domain in, in Melbourne. Uh, they started bringing the men in from the different uh, reserve depots. Uh, some of the first men arrived in, in early March. Uh, some of the last men arrived only two or three days before the, uh, the train embarked for operational service in, in June. Uh, their training was a mixture of uh, learning how to ride horses. Uh, some did know how to ride, many didn't. Uh, learning how to uh, control wagons. Uh, the pontoons that the men were going to use to do their bridging work were being constructed at Cockatoo Island and they didn't turn up until uh, mid-May, so in many respects it was just uh, learning what they could out of a book. Uh, three Army Service Corps drivers were loaned to the unit to teach the men how to uh, 
ride horses and to uh, manoeuvre the wagons. But you can't learn to ride a horse in a week, can you? No, that's, and it took some time. <laughs> it took some time for many of the men, and there were quite a few accidents. One poor chap ended up in hospital with a broken leg by standing behind the horse at the wrong time. Uh, but uh, they persevered, and that was the thing that uh, Brace Girdle uh, put to his men, is that we are all in this together. Uh, some of his uh, officers were only learning the art of bridging out of textbooks a day or so before they were then instructing the course. Uh, two army engineers, warrant officers, were loaned to the unit, and these were experts in, in bridging, uh, and they were teaching the officers who were then teaching uh, the sailors on how to do timber work, putting the bridges together, putting the pontoons together, driving the wagons. Uh, and they were also trying to get their administration together as well. So setting up the camp, getting the men paid, getting uniforms. In fact, many of the men wore naval uniform or their civilian clothing well into uh, late April before their, their own uniforms turned up. Uh, the, the unit was given a, veteran, uh, a vet to uh, look after the horses. A, uh, a surgeon was appointed to the unit for medical uh, support and a number of medics as well. So they became a self-contained unit uh, and that, that was done very quickly from early March of 1915 until when they embarked in, uh, on the 4th of June. And on the 4th of June, John Perriman, what did the Naval Board in Melbourne, who were deploying it, what did they think they were going to do uh, and was the preparation they'd had adequate for that task? Well, they thought that the bridging train was going to steam off over the horizon from Australia bound for England, where they'd be uh, disembarked there in readiness to go over to the Western Front. Um, and, and certainly the men of the bridging train thought that that was where they were heading as well. Um, there were similar units operating on the Western Front. There was uh, the Royal Navy's uh, brigades operating there as well. So they thought that they were going to be complementing that. But uh, that's not quite what happened. And Martin Smee, your grandfather, the, um, the very highly mobile lorry, <laughs> found himself on board the troop ship Port Macquarie, leaving Melbourne the 4th of June 1915. Did he record anything about his passage to what he thought would be uh, the war front in Europe? Yes, he made an extensive uh, uh, mention in his war diary. He started his war diary the day that he actually left uh, here. And it uh, definitely wasn't a very pleasant trip. So if you could imagine 357 men and 412 horses on a very, very poorly ventilated ship heading across the equator, it wasn't very pleasant at all. In fact, the poor horses had a hard time of it. They started dying almost immediately. Uh, they had to throw horses over the side of the ship every day. It wouldn't have been a pleasant task bringing horses up from below decks and throwing them over. Uh, there are even jokes about the same shark following them all the way from uh, over to Colombo. So uh, when they stopped at Colombo, they weren't allowed off the ship at all because there were some nasty riots there. So they, once again, they were confined to ships, so they couldn't get out and stretch their legs and get some fresh air. And from there, they steamed off to Bombay. And by that time, I think they'd realised the horses were not a going concern, and so they unloaded uh, the horses at Bombay. All of the horses? I think all the horses, uh, Greg might be able to ask that one. Yeah, did all of the horses... Did yeah, all, of the... all of the horses were unloaded at Bombay and transferred to the Indian Army. So I imagine the poor sailors that had fallen off horses and all this skill that they'd <laughs> already acquired would be most disappointed. Martin, what happened then between India and what was to be their destination? Well, they sailed then to Port Said in Egypt and where they learnt that they were suddenly to becoming detached from the Royal Australian Navy and were being attached to the British. And they then went to uh, Lemnos and finally ended up at Imbros. And here's where it gets interesting because, uh, as Greg said, that they were originally destined for Europe and now they found themselves on a Greek island. And they were greeted by the naval landing officer who said, and I quote from Laurie's war diary, where are you from, what are you, and who ordered you to come here? Uh, so they felt Laurie, welcome. Yes, welcome. How <laughs> are you? So Laurie also says the next day in his war diary, I might mention in passing that even now nobody knows where and what we are to do. And uh, Laurie and his comrades were actually quite bemused at the presence of their 3,000 tonne ship and all aboard were a complete mystery to the naval command in the area. Uh, they knew they were in a war zone because they could actually see the action Dardanelles from where they were. And, uh, I don't think they were actually fully briefed in the last part of their trip about what they were meant to do. 
Um, from Laurie's writing, it they seemed to have the impression that they were going to prepare for the British landing for a couple of days and then leave. But uh, they were obviously terribly wrong because they stayed there for six months. So, Greg Swindon, they thought they were going to the Western Front, they end up in Egypt, then they get transported to Greece. What's going on? The best that I can work out from, from the uh, various documents is the bridging train arrives at Port Said. Uh, Bracegirdle goes ashore uh, as, norm, as a normal naval officer would do and reports to the senior uh, Royal Navy officer in, in that area, who then discovers that I've got an engineering unit which has got the ability to make pontoon bridges. They don't have any horses anymore and they're going off to England to do more training but I'm about to have a large landing at Suvla Bay on the, the Gallipoli Peninsula. And already, as they'd seen at Anzac Cove, there was a desperate need for uh, bridges, oh, sorry, uh, for uh, wharves to be built uh, and for stores to be brought ashore and maintained and particularly, as John's mentioned before, getting water through to the front line. So my best guess from reading the documents is uh, the British senior command suddenly realised, I've got this unit here and I can use them at Suvla Bay. Let's get them up to, uh, to Lemnos and to just prepare to take part in the Suvla Bay landing. So, John, it's 21st of July, 1915. They're in the Greek islands. What do they do? Where do they go? Well, initially, they, they go to Mudros and um, they spend about three days there before they're then sent off to nearby in Bros. Um, is it hot, cold, winter, look, summer? Where is, are we up to it, with the we're weather? We're up to it, uh, seasonally. It's now hot. The conditions yep. are stifling, um, and the immediate concern is to get these men off the Port Macquarie and ashore. Uh, they do this using their own pontoons, and they're sort of rafted all their equipment. Everything's rafted ashore, um, and then you start to see the the employment of these men start to ferment, because um, they undertake training there in building the pontoons during the hours of darkness with no light and as silently as possible. So I think that it's, it's reasonable to probably assume that someone like uh, Admiral Wester Williams has now got wind that this group is around. He appreciates, because he's been there since February, just how important and what a force multiplier a group like this mm. could be to any potential landing. So their time isn't wasted there and they become quite adept at you know, constructing, deconstructing uh, their pontoons and equipment in darkness ashore. They then embarked in the Atria and they join in on the uh, uh, landings at Suva on the 8th of August. But again, the, the Atria arrives off uh, the landing area quick as a flash, nothing happened. Mm. Most of the men bunk down, get some kip, and meanwhile, Brace Girdle, uh, ever leading from the front, he, he gets himself ashore because he understands the value of, you know, I'm going to have to get ashore, understand the terrain, see what we can contribute, where we might contribute, and, and how this might be enacted. So when he comes back to the ship, he's already identified an area where he considers would be a, the best place to start building these, uh, these piers that can receive large amounts of stores and things like that. So is the, is the requirements, though, of the bridging train, are they well known? beyond Admiral Wester Williams, do, do, do naval officers generally know what bridging trains can do? Can they make the most of what they can offer? This is policy on the run. They're making this up as mm. they go along. But having said that, I think with the experience that, that Brace Girdle has had previously and understanding fully what he has at his disposal and what he can bring to this, I think his, he was a bit of a visionary in that, in that sense. I think he could see that I've got this resource, this is what I'm faced with, this is what I can do to, to add value. And that's what he did. And he was a sensible guy too, because where he set these up, he set them up in the lee, he looked very, very carefully where, you know, it's gonna be the, the, the best place to do it. Uh, and that afternoon, the first 23 men went ashore under the command of a, a Chief Petty Officer Shepherd, I think his name was from, from memory, and they get to it. So on day one, they're there. As we've mentioned, it's hot, they're tired, they're under fire as well. So that, that shouldn't be overlooked. So that's artillery or small, or small arms or both? Artillery mainly, but, yep. uh, and, and it becomes quite a hot area once the, uh, the Turks understand that this landing's taking place. Initially it was a bit of a, a, a quiet reception as I understand it, but it certainly heated up after that. 
And so the idea is that they're making easy the passage from the sea to the land so that people can get over the beachhead and then embark uh, whatever forces and equipment they need and then proceed ashore and then into the hinterland. That's it. And foremost, always foremost, is, is this need for water, water, water. This is one of the enduring themes when you start to study this campaign, uh, that water was the thing that they were most concerned about. Every ship that came out of Malta uh, to the Dardanelles, its double bottom was filled with fresh water. And then, of course, they had to get these things, they had to decanter the water from the ships, get them into whatever they could to get them ashore. Drinking and washing, or just mainly drinking water? Mainly pot potable water. Right. So this is where you see the, uh, the iconic furphy tanks filled with water. Uh, uh, we see those pictures uh, popping up all over the Gallipoli area. But um, that was it. And, and later on, they became quite adept and quite um, ingenious in ways that they could, you know, move this water around. And Greg Swindon, what did they do for the four months that they were there? They didn't know how long they would be. Do they set themselves up well or is it very much a transitory position they've occupied? And, and can you generalise about, you know, the everyday duties that they were performing? Well, once they got ashore, uh, Bracegirdle selected a, a nice little area uh, in the northern part of Suvla Bay, which the Australians named Kangaroo Beach, and that became the Australian uh, bridging train base. They started uh, building dugouts, uh, you know, basically you know, digging into the sand and the rock, uh, timber over the top of sandbags to protect themselves from the shelling, which was, which was fairly constant, and every now and again uh, some sniper fire. So they had to protect themselves. Uh, they then started being utilised to build a number of wharves uh, along the Suvla Bay area uh, from both the north and southern ends, so that uh, boats getting to... Uh, uh, Suvla Bay didn't have to physically come up onto the beach, which mm. was quite shallow. They could go alongside a wharf, unload water, unload ammunition, unload food, and backload the wounded and the sick. Was it heavily <coughs> tidal in the area? It was heavily tidal, so they had to uh, build these piers, uh, sometimes you know, two or three hundred metres out into uh, the bay in order to uh, uh, deal with the tides. They also very quickly became uh, an engineering unit for other tasks. So they were uh, digging dugouts for other units uh, so that they could then use those troops in the front line as opposed to uh, doing the protection work. But as John's mentioned, water became uh, absolutely vital. And so the boats were coming in from uh, both Egypt and Malta carrying the water. The bridging train was given the, uh, the task of looking after the water supply for all of Suvla Bay. And so they would get the water ashore, often in uh, drums, and then uh, load those into, or load it into water tanks. At one point they uh, secured a fire hose from one of the British warships and uh, ran that fire hose uh, forward to the front line uh, so they could start pumping water through to the troops. Uh, many of the soldiers discovered that it was actually easier if they pierced that fire hose with their bayonet and then filled up their water tanks. Uh, <coughs> so they then replaced it with steel pipe. And did they ever get used, though, as essentially infantry? There, was, there were some opportunities for that. Uh, at one time, there was a, a small group under Lieutenant Bond, who was the XO of the unit, went forward to uh, an area known as the Chocolate Hill, uh, simply because of the, the colour of the earth and that they were there to help dig trenches as infantry were moving forward. And they spent uh, several days under fire. Uh, the advance was stopped, uh, but, and they were never actually utilised to dig the trenches because they never moved forward. Some of the men decided that uh, things were a little bit uh, boring down uh, at, the, at the beach and would often take their rifles and sneak away uh, to get to the front line. Um, one chap, uh, in order to celebrate his 21st birthday, uh, went forward with some friends to uh, have a pot shot at the Turks and uh, was quite lucky because uh, the Turks shot back at him and uh, the bullet uh, took off his uh, right ear. Uh, only for one inch it would have killed him. Uh, others went forward and uh, three of the uh, bridging train men found a, um, a British soldier who had been caught in the open and was being uh, shot at by Turkish snipers. They then uh, killed those Turkish snipers, rescued this... Uh, young British soldier and took him back to his unit. Uh, uh, the CO of the unit was very happy to get that soldier back, but the bridging train men said, please don't tell our CO because we'll be in trouble <laughs> because we're not allowed to be away from the beach. 
Uh, unfortunately, when they got back, uh, one of them was discovered and uh, earned himself uh, 14 days uh, loss of pay for breaking out of camp. Well, um, there's lots of ways you could interpret both the punishment and the action. Martin Smee, um, Grandfather Laurie, what kind of war did he have at Gallipoli? Um, it's quite interesting, his war diary, how his uh, tone changed from the very first day because uh, on the day of the landing, he sort of said it was a glorious occasion. He had very upbeat praise about it all, describing the, the August landing with 10,000 men with ship's cannons blazing away as a beautiful day indeed. Uh, this is despite him quoting 5,000 killed and 15,000 wounded. Um, his tone became a little bit uh, more despairing over the months that were, were there. Um, basically, he's every, just every day they were bombed down there and he got quite blasé in his war diary about this, saying things like, the Turk shells persist in trying to send us to heaven or hell and the Turks had a little bit more fun today, and the Turks got into their minds to give us a bombing today. So he actually got reasonably blasé about that in the end, which was quite surprising. Um, he had a few close shades with some bombs going off nearby him on the beach, and he also did uh, do one of those expeditions away from Kangaroo Beach and got shot at, and he returned and, and shot. He had one shot, I think, for the war, which he said went high and wide. So, <laughs> Um, was he afraid? I mean, did he talk about being fearful, no. scared, frightened? I, there, there was never any of those type of emotions sort of came through. It was just, yeah, there's a blasé about it all, about, yeah, we're getting bombed today, and, you know, a guy had a shot at me, and I shot back and missed him, and we went back down the beach and got a few mementos and had to keep our heads down, but there was never any of that type of emotion came through in the war diary. Um, things started to get very bad around about uh, November. Uh, they weren't uh, supplied with tents, and uh, so they were living in dugouts. The weather got very cold, very wet. Um, and one thing I'll read from his war diary, it's actually quite sad here because this is November 29th, Monday, and uh, there'd been probably about an inch of rain overnight right across the peninsula, and it went down to freezing. And I'll just read from his law, war diary here because it's quite uh, air wrenching. It said, the weather is bitterly cold and the dugouts and timber is coated with snow. There's another site that I'm about to relate that looks awful. During Sunday night, the rain fell in torrents and on top of that came the snow, which naturally put everything to a standstill for the time being. And during the day, 2,000 men, infantry, mountain battalions, Royal Engineers, have been suffering something awful as the first, second and reserve trenches are overflowing with water. And the men remained in them until 7 a.m. Monday when they received orders to retire. And those that had the strength to crawl or drag themselves out did so. The remainder had to remain in the tent frozen to their rifles and consequently to death. And if one could see the poor wretches standing up in water their armpits and frozen as they stand. It's possible even now, Tuesday, to walk from one end of the trench to the other and see the lads in dozens standing up, but not counting those that are underneath the ice, which is six to eight inches thick throughout. Um, that's quite a tragic thing to, to experience there. But on the same hand, he sort of says, we've had a snow blizzard and the outcome cost the British lines 10,000 casualties, while the Anzac, seven miles distant, where the Australian New Zealand troops were entrenched, met with the same fateful blizzard and only sent two men away suffering from exposure. Uh, this is due to the fact the Australian trenches were drained while those at Suvla were not allowing water to drain from the trenches. So we have a, a quite a disparaging thing here between the Australian and the British trenches where the Australians were very adaptive and actually decided to drain their trenches where the British actually didn't. Um, by late November, uh, it's getting close towards the evacuation. Laurie's gone into quite deep despair here. He says, well, well, one wonders what's to come next. This is Tuesday the 30th of November, and we've been here since 8th August, four months and eight days. Even now, there's not a place of shelter erected on this mainland for the troops, nor there is a soup, kitchen or tea or anything of the kind. And while I'm writing this, the motors and wagons and mule teams are bringing thousands of poor wretches down from the firing line with arms, legs, ears, noses frozen off. We have 18 men in our galley, 46 in the dugout, and 40 foot divided amongst the various dugouts, and eight in hospital, all for the want of attention. Uh, down at West Beach, they're dying as fast as they can be brought down because there's no space to put 
uh, except in the open, with cases of biscuits around them and a huge green tarp holding over the top. So that when each man comes in, they have to open up the covering to get him in, and if poor rich dies, drag him out. So it became very unpleasant about that time. Uh, the other things that stand out in there is that every day Laurie describes what he had to eat. So the, the comfort of, of daily rations was sub, probably about one of their only few pleasures there. And he also mentions, of course, when they got their run ration. Being in the Navy, that's quite important, I believe. Well, it was. It was. Yeah. Now, now, Greg, can you tell us just uh, generally what were the casualties suffered by the bridging train in its four months on the peninsula? Well, compared to the infantry, they were quite light. Uh, four men died as a result of their service at, uh, at Gallipoli. Uh, poor old Chief Petty Officer Perkins uh, lost most of his head to a, a shell fragment and able seaman uh, Charlie Shank uh, was hit by a couple of shrapnel balls in the, in the forehead and, and later died. So those two men died uh, as a direct result of enemy action. Another two men died from sickness, uh, uh, but over 60 men were wounded or injured uh, whilst they were doing their jobs. Um, able seaman Atkinson uh, lost a leg to, to shell fire and he was quite saying Freud about it as the, uh, the surgeon was uh, applying a tourniquet, saying, oh, well, you'll find me outside uh, Flinders Street Station now selling peanuts, I suppose, because <laughs> I've got nothing else to go back to. Uh, <clears throat> but a number of men, you know, bad, quite badly wounded, and that was mainly by shell fire. Uh, the, the food was, was quite ordinary. Uh, there was a reasonable amount of it, uh, so men started to suffer from, from jaundice uh, and from other... Uh, uh, lack of vitamin related illnesses. Uh, some of the men had malaria previously from their time in Germany New Guinea, so that started to flare up again. So the bridging train, even though it nominally had a, a 315 men in it, it was probably down to about 200 effective men at times because of injury and illness. Uh, reinforcement started to come through in dribs and drabs. And just the hardships of being there. And hardships of uh, being there. I mean, John, were, were there many decorations, awards, medals given for, you know, extraordinary deeds? Or should really they all have got something, it sounds, just for being there? Well, look, uh, the contribution made was, was certainly, um, you know, a significant one. Um, I think uh, Bracegirdle was certainly recognised. Um, in fact, he picked up, uh, in, in his time with the bridging train, three mentions in dispatches and a distinguished service order. Um, his first mention in dispatches was for the, uh, the reconnaissance he did for the initial landing. Um, the second one was actually involved in uh, the part that he played in, in getting the men out. Uh, and I'm not just talking about the bridging train, we're talking about the, the whole evacuation. Um, and the DSO f followed uh, the, the following year with another MID. So, and there were others, of course, that, um, that were decorated as well. Uh, his 2IC, Bond who had a DSO from the Australian Naval and Military uh, Expeditionary Force in New Guinea, he received a mention in dispatches as well. Uh, and he, he sort of comes across as uh, one of these interesting characters in the train where, you know, uh, he presents as someone who seemed to have a bit of a penchant for the action side of things. Greg's already mentioned how he, he went up to the, uh, uh, the front line there with a group of men. But uh, there's other aspects of, of him which, which emerged later, which, which, which aren't so good. But, um, but the important thing is, I suppose, for the viewers, is that they did get recognition for what they did, and it wasn't a case of, oh, they're on the edge, they were ignored, forgotten. There was no sense of that. No sense of that. In fact, the British were very, very complimentary about the work of the, of the bridging train. Uh, and again, I go back to, to Admiral Weems, who, who emerges later in the story again, and uh, his recognition of that, and the Australians more broadly. And Martin, is it the case that um, Uncle, uh, rather Grandfather Laurie, was aware of the evacuation and did he write much about it in his uh, diary or was it the case that he heard with very sh short notice that they were leaving and was it a matter he just recorded but not described? Um, interestingly, his, his war diary, uh, as Greg will attest because he helped me transcribe it, the writing was incredibly small and when uh, he decided, I think he wasn't going to get out of there. The writing became smaller and smaller and smaller. And uh, during the time of the evacuation, the writing became bigger because I think he realised he could get out of there now and he had spaced his war diary. But he didn't actually say a whole lot. I think they were so busy, they were working around the clock, uh, trying to shore up all their, 
evacuation plans and, and getting the, the pontoons ready, that he actually didn't write very much through that time apart from the fact that they were just working hard and long hours. But he didn't sort of uh, let on to what the evacuation plan or any of that thing or anything that was going on about the time. So they're on reduced rations and they're working very, very long hours because they had to destroy all the stores before they left and leave nothing behind for the Turks. And uh, a group of 50 men have been dispatched with uh, Sub-Lieutenant Hicks and they went over to Lababa, Lalababa, sorry, to construct a pier there to get rid of the, or to evacuate the last of the British troops, which were meant to sort of sit there and, and hold the beach until the last man to protect the evacuation. So the bridging train were the last off of Gallipoli, as uh, Greg will probably tell you. Well, is it, Greg, the stuff of which legends are made? So the Navy was first in, now we're hearing it's last out. Is it legendary stuff, or is it just an efficient operation that, uh, that reflected their ability to get themselves off quietly and efficiently? It was a very efficient operation, as we uh, now well know that the, the evacuation was the best part of the, uh, of the <laughs> campaign. You know, virtually no men lost, uh, thousands of men evacuated safely. Uh, a large quantity of stores obviously had to be left behind and destroyed. But as Laurie's mentioned, uh, sub Lieutenant Hicks took a, uh, a group of men down to an area known as Lala Baba uh, on the southern side of uh, Suvla Bay, and they uh, constructed a pier there, which was the final evacuation pier for the rear guard for uh, the, the Suvla Bay area. Uh, in the, around about the 15th and 16th of um, December, the bulk of the bridging train began to evacuate from. Uh, from Kangaroo Beach uh, and went back initially to Imbros and then eventually to, to Mudros Harbour. Uh, Hicks and his men uh, left uh, at uh, 4.30 on the morning of the 20th of, of December. They were basically there to maintain the pier and, and some of the men said that they were extra rear guard but that may have been wishful thinking. Uh, the Turks certainly continued their shelling uh, throughout that period and the pier was badly damaged on the 19th so uh, Hicks and his men had to then uh, do quite a number of repairs. Uh, Hicks writes that you know, basically they were standing there uh, in the cold on the morning of the 20th, waiting for the, uh, the last of the rear guard men to, uh, um, to appear, and uh, General Maud, who was the uh, commander of the southern section, they arrived, got into a number of boats and some of the, the beetle landing craft that were being used, uh, and then basically uh, departed with a bridging train man being the last man off the wharf into the, into the boats to uh, remove the, the uh, rope holding them on. And that was that, but not the end of the bridging train. John, where did they go, what did they do, and how did they fare? OK, well, this is, this is another interesting part of this story. So they eventually get back to Lemnos and Mudros, and when they get there, um, you know, they're, they're bushed, you know, as you'd expect. So they have some downtime. Uh, there's many members of the AIF there as well, and they have been paid. They have money, and they are able to purchase... So the Army guys have been paid? They have. But the Navy guys? They haven't been paid. There's been a foul-up with their pay, and, and that prohibits them from being able to buy fresh fruit and vegetables and all of those things. You can imagine someone's been on you know, the peninsula for, for the length of time they have, and they're longing for this sort of stuff, and they have no means of getting it because they have no money. So they raise this with their officers, and to be perfectly frank, it's, it's not a satisfactory response. Um, and as a result of that, uh, they refused to turn to for a parade. In fact, the, the story goes that the night before they were due to turn to for the following day's parade, the tent flaps were pulled open, and it was a very, very perfunctory, we're not parading tomorrow. Uh, no one ever identified who that individual was, ever. Uh, but the next day, 189 of the bridging train did not fall in for parade. So there's no ringleader, but there's a mutiny, you could say, if it's willful, collective disobedience to an order. Yes, you could say that. But was there a ringleader? Uh, we'll never know. Uh, and, and, but they certainly had that, um, that, that brotherhood, if you like, that... Uh, and it certainly seemed like a very good idea to them. Because the other thing that needs to be taken into consideration, the fact that these men aren't getting paid, that doesn't just affect them. That's affecting their families who have a lot of back home. Yeah. So, and, and they're concerned about that. This is a big deal. And the fact that they raised it with their officers and it wasn't pursued as vigorously as it could have been brought it to this, this point. So 
What happened at this point uh, is important because Brace Girdle is no longer with them at this stage. He has come down with jaundice, he has been evacuated, leading Bond in charge. And Bond took a pretty dim view of this. And when he was told to round up the ringleaders, um, the 189 people who took part in this mutiny were disarmed and placed under guard, okay? Uh, their future to be determined. So uh, they're now in a bit of a, a precarious situation, having performed very, very good service ashore, and now they've, they've got to this point. Because um, it's dishonourable, isn't it? I mean, it, does, it doesn't make them individually or collectively look good. It's a, it's a kind of slur, isn't it, on their reputation? Well, it is a slur. Is that how they're the, seeing it? And, and what it does is, um, you know, all the way through, they have demonstrated themselves to be a very, very disciplined, cohesive, uh, ingenious unit. So how's it resolved? OK, it's resolved. Um, they're then moved, OK, and... Um, I think they went to, was it Alexandria they went to? Yeah, Alexandria. They, to Alexandria. And they're, again, they're placed under guard there uh, for the situation to be, you know, resolved. Now, at this point, Brace Girdle is coming back to the unit. And who should meet him at Alexandria Railway Station than the aforementioned Admiral Wester Weems, who has a very, very high regard for the Australians. In fact, when the Australians first arrived at Gallipoli, um, he describes them as being, you know, the most magnificent, you know, specimens he's ever seen. And he actually takes the time to get down to know the men of the AIF and he forms his affinity with them early. So he's then followed the, the exploits of the bridging train ashore and when he learns of this, he very presciently meets Brace Girdle and says, look, you know, what's going on? You've got four days to go and find out and let me know. So Brace Girdle does this, and he soon arrives at the um, conclusion that in his absence, this perhaps hasn't been um, handled well by his officers, who haven't shown the degree of empathy that they should have. Um, and he reports this back to Weems, who takes it upon himself to have the men fallen in, and he addresses them. And it's at that point that he turns around and says, as far as I'm concerned, this is a complete washout. Uh, your pay will be resolved. In fact, the irony of this was the pay was there the whole time. It was a complete foul up where this person wasn't talking to that person, that person wasn't talking to this person, and we read about this often in the history of the... So you can blame the paymasters? <laughs> I'm not apportioning blame, <laughs> but yes. <laughs> no, it, it's not that easy, but, you know, it was, it was just a series of unfortunate events. Um, anyway... It was a washout. He tells them this, and he then goes on to compliment them on the work that they've done as the bridging train and grants them leave. Greg, what happens to them then? Are they just uh, sent back to Australia, dispersed, join other units? Because presumably the task for which they have been raised has been done. They're not needed on the Western Front. What happens to them? Well, they are still needed because uh, where they're waiting now in you know, January 1916 is down on the Suez Canal. And uh, the Suez Canal has a number of pontoon bridges crossing it oh. so to allow uh, troops and materiel to cross into the Sinai where the Turkish forces are located. Uh, but those bridges need to be broken or opened up uh, regularly to allow shipping to go through. So this is the perfect work for the, for the bridging train. They're so there is a job for them? There is a job for them. Yeah. So they're sent to Ishmaelia uh, initially uh, where they work for four or five months uh, maintaining the, uh, the swing bridges or pontoon bridges over the, the Suez Canal. Uh, they then moved further south uh, to the Southern Canal Zone uh, where again they look after the, the pontoon bridges. And this is you know, making the bridges so that uh, troops and material can cross and then breaking the bridges uh, and floating to the side of the canal so that ships could pass, maintaining them, uh, plus digging uh, defensive works on the, uh, on the eastern side of the, uh, the canal. And when do they finally get home? <clears throat> Eventually, uh, the war is moving fairly uh, rapidly in, uh, in the Sinai. Uh, the Turks are being forced back. Uh, the bridging train takes part in uh, an amphibious landing at El Arish on the northern uh, coastline of the Sinai, uh, where 50 men under brace girdle land uh, on the beach and start putting uh, uh, a number of um, uh, wharves together and unloading supplies. They're then, it's then planned that they're going to be used to uh, do more of that work 
uh, in Palestine as the advance continues. The trouble is some of the administrative paperwork is now starting to catch up with the bridging train. Uh, so back in Australia, it's, they're saying, oh, these were mutinous dogs back in January, you know, let's, let's disband this unit and, uh, and uh, get rid of them. Uh, so they start to look at, is the bridging train needed uh, for the advance into Palestine? Yes, it is. Uh, do we need a full 300-man bridging train? No, we don't. We only need about 100 men. So what are we going to do with the other 200? So the admin starts to uh, get together and they go, right, we're going to disband this unit and only maintain a small unit to do uh, wharf and pier construction into Palestine. Eventually it all gets very confused and the order comes through to disband the unit but not create the new unit. So the men are then given the offer. You've got two options. You can go back to Australia and join the Royal Australian Navy or you can transfer to the first AIF. So about half the men decide that they're going to transfer to the, to the AIF and at this stage obviously the AIF is struggling to, uh, to make up numbers. Make up yeah. numbers. Obviously the conscription debate is uh, in full swing in Australia. So they're more than happy to take uh, trained men. The bulk of them end up going to artillery units, but there's some go to the light horse, uh, some to the Australian Flying Corps, uh, some to infantry units. The rest of the men, about 150 of them, are then embarked uh, in uh, a, a transport ship, the Buller, uh, to be sent back to Australia, where they believe that they're going to be allowed to transfer to the Royal Australian Navy. When they get back to Australia in July of 1917, they land in Melbourne and they're told, there is no deal for you to be able to transfer to the RAN at your current rank. Uh, you're going to be uh, demobilised. Some of the men decide, that's great, I've had two and a half years overseas service, I'm more than happy to come back to Australia, I've done my bit. I've had enough, I've that's had enough. It. Yep. That's it, I've had enough. Others go, oh, I really want to continue to serve. And so they march down the gangplank, they're given two weeks leave, and then they rejoin the first AOF. It all seems pretty unsatisfactory. It is. It's, it's an it's, ignominious end for some fairly brave and courageous yeah. men. And, and it's a bit hard today to understand going, you know, we have the communication systems now, you know, obviously with telephones and emails, etc. But back then, they had letters and telegrams, you know, crisscrossing the, the globe, you know, what's going to happen to the bridging train, disband them, no, bring them back, transfer them to the RAN. And so it just becomes this hodgepodge of uh, administration as to what are we going to do with these guys. And in the end, it just, they faded away. Mm. Mm. Let's then finish with, if I can, first ask you, Martin, what's one thing that you would want us to take from this podcast as what you think is an important legacy of the bridging train and their service? Um, well, after reading it all I can about it, and uh, Greg's found stuff for me to read over the years, I think they were a, they were a pretty diverse group. and. Uh, they weren't really prepared for what was thrown at them at the at Gallipoli. They thought they were going somewhere else, and all of a sudden they've landed on this, this hellhole of a place. They were amazingly adaptive people. They were, I think they were very hardworking. They were very loyal. And I think their common sense and ingenuity helped save many British lives in that particular theatre of war. And I think it helped make life more bearable for the British people there as well. Um, I think their treatment was, was pretty regrettable. My father was one, grandfather, sorry, was one of the mutineers, and uh, his story was very really despairing at the time about what was going on. Um, he went to Egypt, and uh, once again, I think being seafaring men, they were quite bored there at being away from the sea, and he was one of the people who took up the option to, to come back to Australia. And my father said, legend has it, that he was met at the end of the gangplank Gang, thanks, sorry, at Port Melbourne by a recruitment officer said, you want to sign up? And, and uh, Laurie said, no, thank you. I've had enough of this. So uh, I think the train sit very well in the Anzac traditions and spirits. And uh, I'm very proud to sort of hear their story and tell their story to other people who want to listen to it. So adaptability. Greg, what do you take from their service? What's their legacy that you'd want us to grab hold of? They ended up... Uh being the most highly decorated RAN unit during the First World War. People look at you know, the actions of uh, HMAS Sydney and the men on the Zabruge raid. The, the bridging train, by sheer numbers of awards, were the most highly decorated unit. 
Bryce Girdle, as we heard, was awarded the Distinguished Service Order, and, and rightly so for his work, and mentioned in dispatches three times. But another 16 mentioned in dispatches were awarded to other members of the unit. And Brace Girdle made sure that they weren't just to the officers and the senior NCOs or the senior sailors. Many of the junior personnel received awards as well. well let's hope that part of their service, that they were highly uh, recognised, is something people take from the podcast. Finally, John Perryman, what do you think we should take from their service? I think uh, the story of the bridge and train really does underpin uh, uh, how it supported that amphibious, that first amphibious landing operations. And I think that the lessons learned, um, not just within the Australian context, but more broadly, about supporting a campaign of that magnitude, um, what began to be fully understood. This is where we, uh, at the end of that campaign, you have the Admiral in charge who's starting to talk in the first terms of the need to have joint command, the need to have the Army and the Navy speaking with one another. Uh, and indeed, uh, it did serve as the template for the D-Day invasions uh, in 1944. Uh, on that occasion, we didn't see piers and bridges, but we did see mulberry harbours. We did see the pipeline under the ocean, providing them with oil. Um, we did see much more innovative and more creative ways of getting people ashore rather than just on uh, lighters and barges and in steam pinnaces. So that whole Dardanelles campaign whilst it was a, is disastrous in one context, there were many, many lessons learned from it that were uh, put into uh, effect in the, the second great conflict of the 20th century. Mm. Well, sadly, that's all we have time for today. Can I uh, thank Greg Swindon, John Perryman and Martin Smee for their time, for their insights, to hear about family members, to hear about those that we ought to remember. We hope that you've enjoyed this podcast and that you join us again very soon. Bye for now.